okay? And we defined something called a meromorphic function, which had an isolated set of poles where we allowed. So we had the removable singularities. We had the poles. And we had uh, the third class was essential singularities. And then I said also that this was not everything. I mean, we could also have other uh, kinds of behavior. Uh, for example, branch points for the logarithm. But these would then typically not be isolated. So these are the three types of isolated singularities. We also have non-isolated which would then be branch points and, and so on. So for example, the complex square root and the, and the logarithm. And then we said that we had, a, so F has a pole or a zero uh, at infinity. So we look at, at this uh, Riemann sphere, remember, the C union infinity is this picture here. Here we have the North Pole, which we identified with infinity. And we said that this was just a point like any other, okay? And that we could map this uh, North Pole to zero, I mean to, to the South Pole, which would correspond to zero in the complex plane, by the map Z goes to, to one over Z if you remember this, <coughs> sorry. So F had a pole at infinity if and only if, uh, so F of one over Z, so had a pole zero at infinity if and only if this had a pole or a zero at Z equals zero. Okay, so we said that uh, something like Simplest possible examples, you know, we looked at this three over Z, so we said that F of one over Z is then equal to three Z, which then has a zero of order one at Z equals zero, so this has a pole of order one at infinity, and so on and so forth. So the question I just want to make before moving on, so the main topic of today will be essential singularities and the residue theorem. But before moving on, I just want to make some last remark on how we can understand these poles and zeros at infinity and what is a meromorphic function at infinity. So, or a meromorphic function on all of this uh, Riemann sphere. So, how can we understand uh, poles or zeros at infinity? What does it mean to be meromorphic? or holomorphic uh, at infinity. So of course the definition of being holomorphic in a neighborhood of a point is always the same because I mean we just transport this point infinity to zero by looking at f of one over z and then if this function is then holomorphic, uh, meromorphic or holomorphic in the usual sense then it is uh, also, then we say that f of z would be holomorphic or meromorphic in a neighborhood of infinity. Okay, but so uh, some kind of uh, example or exercise here. So suppose that f is an entire function, so it's uh, holomorphic on the entire complex plane, okay? And then we want to see what happens at this extra point that we did not cover up here and see what happens at infinity. So uh, suppose for a second that it has a pole at infinity and a pole of order capital N. Then by definition, what does it mean? Well, it means that if I look at this G of Z, which is f of one over z, then this one 
has a pole of order n at z equals zero, right? And then what does this mean? Well, you will remember that we saw last time uh, we showed that we had, or we discussed about the Laurent series expansion. So it means we have a Laurent series. So where the sum starts at minus n, goes up to infinity. So uh, yeah, around zero. So we have this kind of uh, this kind of series. Okay, so it is equal to this. I just write it separating these uh, these parts. And then we note that the so-called singular part of this expansion, so the singular part was this, right? And this singular part. A is zero in the principal branch. Ah, A is zero, yes, 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 A is zero. Very good, sorry. A was zero, so Z to the N, Z. Thank you. So this thing is just a polynomial in one over Z, right? This is polynomial. In one over Z. So what does it mean? Well, we can look at f of one over z minus this polynomial in one over z. So we're looking at this, but we subtract away the singular part. What are we left with? Well, this part over here. And now, what can we say about this close to zero? So in a neighborhood of zero, this thing has to be bounded, right? So this is bounded near zero. So it means that, you know, if you subtract the singular part, then this function is bounded near zero. Well, this is the same as saying that f of z minus p of z, so now if I go back, Again, we have this map, z goes to one over z, this transition map from the various charts on the, on the manifold. So it means that this one is bounded near infinity, if you want. So in the neighborhood of this, uh, of infinity, of the North Pole, we have that f of z minus p over z is bounded. Professor. Yes. How do I see that uh, this f1 over z minus p1 over z is bounded near zero? Sorry, I had a hard time hearing what you said. Uh, how do I see that uh, this f1 over z minus p1 over z is bounded near zero? So, okay, so it's because close to zero, it's equal to this power series, and you see if, you, if z here is close to zero, then, I mean, here, so this has a radius of convergence, right, where this is some... Um, finite, uh, I mean, well-defined thing, no? Right, thank you, Professor. Yeah. Okay, so thank you for the question. And so, hence, this means by definition, again, this definition here, going backwards from this definition, we see that f of z minus p of z is bounded near infinity, but this means that we have a function which is entire, so it's holomorphic on the entire complex plane, and when you approach infinity, then it is bounded. So what would you say we can conclude about such a function? Any ideas? Constant. Exactly, it is constant, very good. So by uh, Liouville, it has to be constant. So by Liouville, This f of z minus p of z is constant. Okay, so if f of z minus p of z is constant, then it means that f of z is equal to p of z plus a constant. So the conclusion is that f of z is a polynomial. Okay. 
Okay, so what we said is now that, in other words, the conclusion, or corollary if you want, can be seen as a, a theorem. So a function which is, uh, so if you have a pole of order n at infinity, then, and you are entire, then you are necessarily a polynomial. So what about if you had a removable singularity at infinity? What would happen then? Any ideas? Would it be constant, professor? Yes, very good. So if you have a removable singularity at infinity, then f is constant. So this means that if f is a holomorphic function, on all of C hat, so it's holomorphic everywhere on C, but it's also holomorphic at infinity, then, then actually this holomorphic function has to be constant. This is what we said, right? Because we know that if you have a removable singularity, then you extend to an analytic function in the neighborhood of this point. So this means that the holomorphic function on the entire Riemann sphere is just a constant. So there are no other holomorphic functions that are holomorphic everywhere on the Riemann sphere. Okay? So uh, on the other hand, we had the following corollary from what we just showed. So an entire function is either, so there are two choices. So either it's a polynomial. So this includes, of course, the constant function. Or, what's the other possibility? Well, the other possibility is that, uh, so f, it's either a polynomial, or f has an essential singularity at infinity. Okay, so this means that either it's a polynomial, so there's something very simple, or it has an essential singularity at infinity, which means it is a very complicated object, right? So, uh, so this is uh, a nice exercise. Uh, actually, this was on the exam last year, by the way, as one of the simpler questions. And then uh, we have the following exercise that I will give you. That a function, yeah, so the question now is, uh, we showed that holomorphic functions must be constant, but what about meromorphic functions. So if you have a function on C hat, which is allowed to have a certain number of poles, so it could have poles uh, a bit uh, everywhere. For example, a rational function would satisfy this. So what can we say about meromorphic functions? Does anybody know? Only rational functions. Only rational functions, you say? Riemann sphere. Yes. Yes, yes. It's meromorphic. Full Riemann sphere. Yeah. You're absolutely right. So the exercise is that the function is meromorphic on the entire Riemann sphere if and only if uh, f is rational. Okay. So first thing you do is you try to understand that rational functions are actually uh, meromorphic on the whole Riemann sphere. So in other words, a rational function has a pole at infinity, not an essential singularity. And the other thing, which is a bit of a nicer exercise, is that you can try to see if you can actually manage to prove. So it's not very hard, but you, know, you have to find the right ideas. So it's a good test if you have understood these singularities at infinity. So you show that any meromorphic function must be of this form. If it's meromorphic on the entire C hat. Okay, and then I had some examples in the in the lecture notes, uh, but we will we will skip those. So now, well, are there any questions about this? In the meantime, I write down the title of the next part, which is the essential singularities that we should cover. OK. 
Okay, no questions? So, uh, in that case, so to summarize, so to summarize, we had these uh, three cases. So, you had some function which had a singularity, so it's holomorphic everywhere on this. But then it had some singularity in A. So then we had uh, three possibilities. But this is another way of saying, so I'm not going to say the same thing as over there, that we have removable singularities, poles, or essential singularities. But I'm going to say that either this uh, goes to 0 as z goes to a, and for some r, uh, real number, or This kind of thing goes to infinity as z goes to a, some r in r. Or we have the case where none of these two happen, so none of the above. OK, so in your opinion, uh, where in these three cases can we find the case of poles and removable singularities? So, uh, so the first is the poles. So yeah, so actually the first, the first two can be either poles or removable singularities, but not essential. And then the essential ones will correspond to the case, case C. Okay. So, uh, so the essential singularities they are in here. when you do not have this kind of, kind of behavior. So of course, to understand these conditions, you should look, for example, at the Laurent expansion, and you see, okay, if you multiply by z minus a to the r, okay, how does it behave? Um, now, as an example of an analytic, of an essential singularity, let's start with that. Okay, so just to, I mean, I know I, I said this before, but just to make sure it's absolutely clear, I mean, the definition of is an essential singularity is an isolated singularity which is not a pole and not a removable singularity. So it's sort of a, a definition that collects all the rest, all the remaining possibilities. And the typical example would be f of z e to the 1 over z is the, the standard example. Okay. So, for, so this one is holomorphic on C when z is not 0, right? So the problem is what happens when z is equal to 0. So this one, and the claim, of course, not surprisingly, is that it has an essential singularity at z equals 0. OK, so to see this, we need to exclude. But for a reason, yes. it is not isolated. Sorry? It is not isolated. It is not isolated singularity at, at zero. Zero is not an isolated point. Uh, why? Because Z, uh, Y is... Uh, So, I mean, the, the way to test what you're saying is that, so where is this function e to be 1 over z analytic? So I think you can see that, uh, you know, if you, if you look at, so if you look at g of z, which is f of 1 over z, then it is e to the z, which is an entire function which means that it's holomorphic everywhere in a neighborhood, I mean, in the C, but where the zero is played by infinity, right? So really, I mean, this, this function, it has to be holomorphic everywhere outside of zero. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you. 
OK? So uh, to see that this is an essential singularity, we need to exclude the possibilities that it is removable or a pole. Okay, so we need to exclude these possibilities. Since the definition of being uh, essential means that it's not a pole and not a, uh, not a removable singularity, this is the only thing, uh, the only reasonable approach you can take. So how do we do this? Why would it not have a pole in zero, for example, for a removable singularity? Okay, so we can start by seeing why it doesn't have a removable singularity. Uh, so the first thing is to note that so if we put so we take some sequence, zk, we just say that it's 1 over k, which runs over the natural numbers. And this implies then that f of zk is equal to e to the k. And what does this do as k goes to infinity? Well, it goes to infinity, right? So what does this mean? means that there is no finite limit and it means that it's not a removable singularity because if it was a removable singularity we would have to be able to put a value in this point that would make the function holomorphic. So no finite limit means that no removable singularity okay, at zero. And the second thing we have to do is to exclude that it's a, that it's a pole. How do we do that? So we do something very similar. We'll say that this is one over K running over all of this. Then we get that F of ZK is equal to E to the minus K, uh, which then tends to zero as k goes to plus infinity. And I claim now that this means that it's not a pole either. Because in a pole, you tend to infinity. Right? Uh, and you tend to infinity from every direction. So what we have done is we found one direction uh, where you know the limit was was zero and we found another one where it was infinity. So it can be neither removable nor a pole. So the behavior here is, uh, is kind of complicated, but fortunately it is kind of easy to recognize if a function is, has an essential singularity or not by looking at uh, the Laurent series. But okay, let me first write that hence it's an essential singularity by virtue of being not a pole and not removable. So now we showed this. Uh, the remark is that e to the 1 over z, we know actually it's power series expansion, right? So this is equal to 1 plus 1 over z plus 1 over z squared, and so on. So this is a power series expansion in 1 over z. So if you look at this thing, it means that the singular part so this is a Laurent expansion. And the singular part of the Laurent series expansion at z equals uh, zero would then have uh, infinitely many terms in the singular part. So here, infinitely many terms in the singular part the Laurent expansion and this uh, corresponds precisely to having an essential singularity. So of course be careful so it has infinitely many terms in the expansion around the point 
which is the essential singularity, right? So it doesn't mean if I take the expansion around some other point, it has to have uh, an infinite number of terms. Indeed, it doesn't. Okay, so uh, is this clear that this example cannot be an example of something that has a pole or a removable singularity? Or maybe you have some other question? So basically, you know, these poles, they are, and these meromorphic functions, they are used a lot in algebraic geometry and so on. Uh, but really what you're thinking about is some generalization of a rational function. And indeed, if you're on a compact manifold, such as this Riemann sphere, the meromorphic functions were exactly the rational functions. So their behavior is kind of nice. Uh, this is the point, right? And on the other hand, when we go to this case of something which is not, uh, that does not have a pole, then all of a sudden the behavior becomes unexpectedly complicated. You know, you would think that there would be something in between, like, okay, either you're a very nice function, you have a pole, or maybe you can be slightly more complicated, but not, you know, uh, horrible. But in fact, we have this very remarkable uh, theorem about essential singularities, that's called the Cassorati Myers-Yas, which is an important uh, theorem to know in this, in this course, which essentially says that, okay, no pun intended for essentially, but this one says that if you have an essential singularity, then the behavior is basically very complicated. So the formal statement is this. If f has an essential singularity at some point a, then for any r greater than zero, uh, the following set, so the image set, so I look here, I take a small disk, sorry, this should be centered in a. So I take a small disk around A, and then I apply F, okay? Full S. Sorry? Full, full, Who is Riemann that? sphere, this mapping. No, no, now I am on C. Equal to Riemann sphere, this. Yeah. Now I am on C here. Yeah, good point. Okay, so mm -hmm. F is, uh, okay. yeah, so now I went back from, uh, yeah. Very good that you remarked on this. So I made for a while here this uh, discussion about uh, poles at infinity and so on. And now I went back to studying essential singularities on C. And remember that being on C, however, it means that you are on the Riemann sphere minus one point. But it doesn't have to be minus the North Pole, right? It could be minus any other point. So it means that you know, in a you can talk about vicinities of infinity, or you can talk about the C centered in, uh, you know, I, for example. Okay, and at any point, you know, you can identify the Riemann sphere minus one point with C through stereographic projection type by holomorphisms, as we say, and then you always get this kind of theorem. So it's very close to saying something about the Riemann sphere. Okay, thanks for that comment. But so now, okay, so we look at the image, so we apply F, and then we apply F again to this uh, set and so on. And then we consider the image of, uh, I mean, sorry. So we apply F, and we wonder what is the image of, of this set. Ah, sorry. There is a little subtlety, so you have to remove a point as well. So the set, but minus this point, okay? So I see what happens to it. Maybe it's mapped to something like that. Question mark. And the answer, which is kind of remarkable, is that actually this one is dense in C. So this, I would say, is a very remarkable thing. No?
So what it means is that I can take for any R, so I can take any disk, very small disk of radius R or radius epsilon if you wish, and then I look at this disk minus the point and I look at the image under a function which has an essential singularity at z equals a, and then it takes this small disk and it just spreads it almost everywhere, right? So the image is dense in the complex plane. It takes just these points very, very close to your essential singularity and they are mapped into a dense set of C. So this is a kind of crazy, crazy idea. I mean, I imagine that when they proposed this theorem, people must have been very skeptical at first. You know, you have these results in mathematics that everybody thinks is true, but they are very hard to prove. And then you have these moments where you just find a result which is completely surprising to everyone, right? And the first one to think of this, I bet it was very surprising for, for all the colleagues he was telling about this. Okay, so why is this true? So this crazy uh, theorem here, this deserves definitely a proof. So how should we go about trying to prove that this image set is dense if we have an essential singularity? Well, the strategy is by contradiction. So we will try to say that suppose that we don't have an essential singularity. This means that we have a pole or a removable singularity. And then, uh, no, sorry. So suppose not, suppose that it's not dense, okay? So, and by showing that it's not dense, we want to show, sorry, we want to show that we then have a pole or a removable singularity. This is the idea. So what does it mean to not be be dense in C? Well, it means that I can take uh, a small neighborhood, so there is a point, C, here, and a small neighborhood around this point of radius R or epsilon or whatever you want. Which one did I take? Uh, yeah, I guess R prime I took. So we can find such a small disk which contains, which is outside of this set, basically. This is what I'm saying. So if it's not dense, okay, then I can find some point in an open neighborhood of this point which is not in this image set. So uh, let me write in words. So we take this complex number C such that absolute value of f of z minus C, so is, is far away, so it's greater than epsilon. Uh, ah, okay, so it was epsilon, I guess, if I had it. Okay. So for any z in, uh, in some disk, okay, and then what do we get? So we want to show that this one is a pole or a removable singularity. Um, okay, so if we look at this function here, so one over z minus a times this, so why am I writing this down? So this thing here is uh, greater than epsilon. And what happens then if z minus a, so if z tends to a, well, so this is greater than epsilon over absolute value of z minus a, so this goes to infinity as z goes to a. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that so we assume, so it means that g of z which is this function, so I write down this function, that this has a pole at z equals a, okay? 
So because we assumed that it was not an essential singularity, right? Uh, well, sorry, okay, sorry. Okay, so this is a poll. And then, let me finish. So when g of z, what does it mean to have a poll? Well, we do the standard thing. It means that if I divide by z minus h with k, where k is then the order of a poll, so where h of z is analytic, and h of a is non-zero. So this is the trick we use over and over again. Uh, and k is the order of the pole. Okay. And now we are essentially done. So we just rearrange it. So we said that g of z was equal to 1 over z minus a times f of z minus c. So what does that mean? It means that f of z is equal to uh, z minus a g of z plus this constant. Uh, yeah, this complex number, which is a constant. Uh, and then g of z was equal to uh, h of z over z minus h vk. So it's equal to this, plus a constant, where h is analytic. So we take an analytic function, which then has uh, no singular part in the Laurent series expansion. And then we divide it by z minus h vk minus 1. And this means that the Laurent series expansion will now have a singular part with at most k minus 1 uh, terms. But at least this means that it is uh, at most a pole. So it means that f pole, or if k was equal to 1, it would be a removable singularity. OK, and this would be uh, a contradiction. Since by hypothesis of a theorem, we assumed that f was, um, that f had an essential singularity. So we assumed that f had an essential singularity, but the image set here was not dense, so we could take this little open neighborhood. And then somehow we showed that actually then we have to have a pole or a movable singularity, so then actually did not have an essential singularity to begin with. So this then means that if you have an essential singularity, then the image has to be dense. Professor. Yes. Uh, in the part where you said that G over Z has a pole at uh, A. Yes. Um, how, how can that be justified? I don't think it's, it's not quite apparent to me. Sorry? Yeah, how can it be justified? I didn't hear the last thing you said. Right. Yeah. That that is that is what I meant. Yeah. So uh, f of z minus c. So taking minus this constant uh, doesn't change anything, right? So if you remember what I wrote down uh, at the beginning of the lecture, very early, uh, just a few minutes in, I said that there were three cases, or I made this claim that there were three cases that if you multiplied a function by absolute value of z minus a to the power r, where r is a real number positive, negative, okay, in this case it's minus one. Then I said that if this limit tends to infinity or zero, then in either of these cases your only possibilities are that you have a zero or a pole. So I'm saying this sort of, I'm not saying that this doesn't need any explanation or any thought or anything, but it's sort of a, a different summary of what we went through. So it's using that fact, if you, think, if you want to think about that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so let's see. So that's, that's all I'm going to say for now about essential singularities. So, uh, I mean, take a look again at this theorem and really, you know, let it sink in how, 
weird and strong this result is in a sense. Quite fascinating. And what I'm just erasing here is something that's good to remember, that in practice you will very often determine if you have an essential singularity or not by looking at the, at the power series expansion. So if you, at the Laurent series expansion, sorry. And if you do not, if you're not able to provide a Laurent series expansion of a function, it's in general very hard to, to tell uh, these things. Uh, and especially hard is to compute what we will talk about now, which is uh, residues. So if you have an essential singularity and you want to know this thing I will define, which is the residue, then you definitely, in practice, you essentially need the, the low down series expansion. Okay, so now we are moving on to something uh, related, but now you will need your understanding of these zeros and poles and essential singularities. And we will apply this, apply your, your knowledge to computing integrals, essentially, or this thing that everybody, I think, has seen. Because I think if you remember one thing from a, from a course in complex analysis that you took, I think it's definitely the residue theorem. This is what, you know, many complex analysis courses, they focus really a lot on this, in my experience. So I don't know if this has been the case for you, but I would always assume that all of you sort of already know in practice how to apply the residue theorem. Although maybe I'm wrong because, you know, uh, I have not had only completely perfect homeworks with these integrals on the residue theorem. So who knows? Uh, we'll just have to see. So in this uh, setup, so this is concerned now with meromorphic functions. So functions with, that are allowed to have poles, but not essential singularities at first. Actually, so the residue theorem also applies to essential singularities. I'll say that right now. But I will start my discussion by meromorphic functions, okay? So suppose that F, and now we leave this uh, Riemann sphere behind for a moment, okay? So now we just work on some, some domain here inside C. So suppose that this is a meromorphic function, but noting that the residue theorem will apply also to F with uh, essential singularities. So the big uh, restriction is that, of course, the zeros have to be isolated, okay? But if you have some holomorphic function outside a set of isolated singularities, then the theorem applies even if these ones are essential. Okay, but for, for some reason, I, you know, I prefer to discuss this in first in the case when it's meromorphic, even though the proof is actually the same. You will see this. But the idea is simply that I take the simplest possible case and then we go and generalize it. We push it along. So first let A be a pole of F of order N. Then uh, again, our way, our canonical way of understanding our function is that we look at our Around series expansion. Okay, so we look at this. And then the definition of residue is very simple. I'm sure you all know this. Just to recall it quickly. The coefficient a minus one, so of course, you know, in this series you could have a very large number of negative coefficients and you have an infinite number of in the, in the regular part. And as I said, it applies actually also to essential singularity, so later we could even allow to have an infinite number of coefficients with, uh, in the singular part. 
But for some reason, this coefficient a minus one will be much more important than the others in this context anyway. And it's actually so important that it deserves a special name, which is kind of curious in itself, right? So, so a minus one is called the residue of f at a, and it's written like this. So there are other ways of writing it. Uh, if you want, if you feel strongly about writing it in a different way, that's okay. Uh, I personally don't have a very strong opinion about, about this. So there are other notations. So this is called residue of f at uh, at a. Okay, so this is the definition. Okay, and now why is this uh, is this so important? Uh, by the way, a remark. So if we have a removable singularity, then can we, how can we see this in the residue? So removable singularity, of course, means that there is no singular part. And actually, this is equivalent to asking that the residue uh, Why is it equivalent? Let me just say that it implies because now I was unsure. This should be equivalent. So then the residue at A would be zero. Okay, whatever. Uh, maybe not such a, such a great remark. Let me instead now try to explain to you why this A minus one, why this little coefficient should be so much more important than, than the others. So does someone have a good explanation to this, by the way? If it's a short one, you know, not replacing the, the whole lecture. Okay, so let me then explain it to you. So the answer, why it is so important, is along the following lines. Is that rearranging uh, terms. So we look at this f of z minus a minus one over z minus a. So this is the big, uh, the big trick. So f of z is all of this, and we take minus a minus one over z minus a. So we take away this coefficient here, corresponding to or this this term here. Then, okay, this is equal to the sum where n is not minus one, but otherwise it goes from minus n to infinity of a n times z minus a to the n. And what is so special, I mean, what changed now that I removed, that I subtracted this, this term here, corresponding to one over z minus a. Now that I subtracted this term, there is a very different property we all of a sudden have for what's left and what is it that. It's primitive. Exactly, very good, it has a primitive. So this is equal to all of a sudden the derivative of something like this. Uh, of, I guess, a n over n plus one of z minus a to the n plus one. So it has a primitive, as you said. And what is so great about having a primitive? Well, we have seen this, right? So we have seen this that uh, If I look at this thing here, it's equal to g prime of z. So this is just writing what it means to have a primitive for g of z holomorphic. 
And this means that if I take the integral for any closed curve gamma u, uh, so such that we have certain properties that I will write in a second, but it's just to avoid uh, sort of uh, stupid uh, degenerate cases. So it's being a bit pedantic with these things, but I will, of course, write them. So the idea is that if you take a curve, gamma, you have a pole A here inside. Take a curve gamma. But I want to take it in such a way that uh, First of all, A is not on gamma, okay? So I don't want it to be on the curve. So it could be inside or it could be outside or something, but I don't want it to be on the curve. And then I want uh, to ask that gamma at the moment so I want to ask that it encloses no other pole. Okay, so there is at most one pole inside this gamma. So you know what I mean by that, right? So if you want to write what it means to be inside gamma, it means that the winding number is not zero. Okay. So uh, anyway, so if you have this property, for example, you could take it to be a small circle around here. So then we have that the integral of gamma of this uh, f of z minus this thing here. If this was g, oh sorry, it was g prime. Okay, so since it has a primitive, it means that it's equal to g of gamma of B minus G of gamma of A by this fundamental theorem of calculus, this extension to complex numbers that we saw on the first lecture uh, in integration. And of course, gamma of A, it's a closed curve. So gamma of A is equal to gamma of B. This is the definition of being closed. The starting point is equal to the end point. So this has to be zero, okay? And this means that Conclusion, if I take my integral of just f dz around this, well, then it is equal to uh, the integral of a minus 1 of all of this. So a minus 1 integral along gamma of dz over z minus a. So this minus this was 0. So we have this equality. And then what is this part here? Do we recognize this part? Winding number of. It is, winding number of. It is the winding number, exactly, yeah. but it's even uh, 2 pi i times the winding number. Yes. To be precise. So this is equal to this uh, residue times 2 pi i n times the winding number. So it's equal to, I can write it with the residue notation and I can put the 2 pi i in front. So you have this. It's equal to 2 pi i times the residue of f at a times n of gamma a. Okay, and for those of you who remember the statement of the residue theorem, you can already see that uh, it starts to look like the residue theorem. The residue theorem would say that uh, this kind of integral would be equal to the sum over all of the uh, zeros or poles, I mean all of the poles, essentially. So it will be sum of all of the poles of, of this kind of thing. So now how can, we, how can we take this simple situation? So now I assumed that I had a function which was holomorphic everywhere except just one pole, or at least I assumed that this gamma was enclosing at most one pole. So now how can I go further? How can I treat the case of when I have more than one singularity? 
And how can I treat the case when I have even an essential uh, singularity? So does anyone have some, some idea? We break up the contour into smaller circles. Yeah, exactly, exactly. OK. Uh, yes, so let me write. Uh, so let me write this observation. Let me write it like this. So you're absolutely right. So we will do exactly what you said. So leading up to this, the observation is that, I mean, so let me just do this informal discussion then. So if you had two poles, okay, so here, so A1 and A2, let's say, and then what you could do, so if gamma, let's say, is this curve, Then you're saying that you can take smaller circles like this, right? And then this would be C1 and this would be C2. And then you're saying that the integral along gamma of S would be equal to the integral of C1 of S plus the integral of C2 of S. By this argument that you can make this uh, cut here. So if some of you uh, do not, so if it's not clear to you yet what I mean whenever I draw this kind of picture, so of course I'm not you know, writing everything out, I'm not trying to be completely rigorous, but I'm, what I'm hoping is that when I draw this picture you understand what I mean, that I look at this curve gamma uh, plus these extra parts and then minus C1 and C2, and since these ones I go once over and once back, these ones will be canceled out, and you can prove this kind of kind of equality. So this is not clear. Uh, okay, you should uh, you should ask. Otherwise, uh, the observation. Okay, so this would treat the case of finite number of poles if we did something like this. But what about an infinite number of poles? So what would we do then? Could it happen that we have an infinite number of poles? So of course, a meromorphic function could have an infinite number of poles, right? Or uh, it doesn't have to be meromorphic. We could look at sine of pi over z. It will have an in, or sine of pi times z, sorry. We can look at this, and it would have an infinite number of, of zeros, or I mean, we can easily find these kind of functions anyway. Yeah, but the inside is finite because it's compact. Exactly, exactly. So the argument is that given this curve, so remember this, I mean, we have a function with an infinite number of poles, but the curve is given. And it means in particular that the curve is inside some compact set. You could take a sufficiently large closed disk, for example. And since we have seen that isolated singularities, well, singularities are isolated, <laughs> rather, the set of poles or zeros would be discrete, and a discrete uh, set of points in a compact set has to be finite. Okay, so the observation is that, oh, very good, by the way, so even if F has an infinite Uh, number of uh, singular points. Isolated. Okay. Um, this, the set of singular points that is discrete. Okay. So uh, there is only a finite number Uh, finite number of them. By any given compact. This, as you said. So, uh, for example, we would take a, a large enough disk. 
So the application would be this, that given the curve gamma, note that, so being outside of gamma means that the winding number is zero, right? This is another way of saying it. The winding number is zero on the complement of this disk uh, for R large enough. So if we take a very large R, depending on the curve gamma, then any point outside of this will basically be outside of, of gamma. If you're outside of this disk is what I'm saying. Uh, and it means that this set of, of singularities such that the winding number is non-zero is inside uh, this compact set, so the closure of, of this uh, large disk. And it's also discrete. Uh, which implies uh, that it has finite cardinality. Okay, so that was just writing again what I, what I was saying. And it means that it's enough to deal with a finite number of points. And then the question becomes, to do uh, also what you, what you explained earlier, to take these circles okay, so uh, to deal with a finite uh, number of, uh, of poles, of singularities, inside gamma, then we just do the following. So to each, so we do the picture over there. So to each AJ, so the poles, the singular points here are A1, I don't know, AN, something like that. So to each AJ, we take uh, the small circle, AJ plus Uh, e to the it. So basically what I'm doing now is just, you know, we, we all had this uh, intuitive argument and we all know what, what we mean, but I'm just trying to write down something. So of course this is what we do in mathematics all the time. When we just discuss, we just draw a picture and it takes one minute and then when we actually want to write it down, uh, I mean this is also important because intuition can often go wrong if we just go with the intuitive picture. So um, we have this such that AJ, so epsilon here is small enough such that this is the only pole, only singularity inside CJ. And we also And we also assume that the disk is small enough so that it actually doesn't, so it doesn't actually cut gamma. So we need it to not be outside, but we need it to be inside. And, you know, A1, A2, we need them to be disjoint. So this one is, uh, is empty. Okay, and then by Cauchy's theorem, okay, so this is a nice point to highlight, I guess, that the residue theorem is first and foremost, it's a consequence of Cauchy's theorem, quite simply, not Cauchy's integral formula or something, but actually just Cauchy's theorem. So by Cauchy's theorem, if we look at this curve, now gamma, 
minus C1, minus C2, and so on, minus Cn. If we look at this, then by Cauchy's theorem, we have uh, that this integral along gamma minus sum of uh, the Cj. So I hope this is clear what I'm doing. All of this, so these are the Cj's three paths. Three, two, and one. So then this one, as we have already established, it has to be, uh, first of all, okay, so by Cauchy's theorem, what is the inside of such a curve? Ah, actually, this is why, this is why I had to take the minus, right? So, so what is the inside of the curve gamma minus C1 minus C2 minus Cn? It's the inside of gamma except for the circles. Sorry? I couldn't hear that well. It's the inside, the inside of gamma except for the circles. Okay, so I didn't hear super well, but I'm guessing that you were saying the entire uh, domain or whatever, but outside of the circles, right? So this is anyway the, the correct answer. So this is why you have to take the minus because you have to orient them. You remember the uh, canonical orientation was to take it counterclockwise. So if you go around C3, the inside is, is what we would say is inside the disk. But then what you label the outside, so if you go minus C3, you go in the other direction, and then the inside of the minus C3 would be everything that's, uh, that's outside then. And if you take gamma minus all of this, then actually it will be a curve, uh, so which is, which does not have any poles inside. So it's a closed curve. Of course, I have not told you, but I'm always using these small bits. But so it's a closed, closed curve with no poles inside, which means that it's holomorphic, simply put, in, a, in the region. And so Cauchy's theorem actually applies, and it says that this is equal to zero. Is that part okay? Okay, so Cauchy's theorem applies, it's equal to zero. On the other hand, um, we have that this thing here is equal to, of course, the integral of gamma minus the, this finite sum, so j equals one to n, of the integral along cj of f of z dz. Okay, so it means that, yeah, and then these things here, or rather these things here, sorry, so they are equal to uh, two pi i by the computation we did earlier. So of course, when you look at this part, then we are in the situation that we covered, where we just have one singularity, one pole inside. I mean, earlier we did it for poles, but actually this argument that subtracting this term corresponding to one over z minus a means that you obtain a fun what's left is a function which has a primitive, it still works, even if you have an infinite number of terms in the singular part, okay? So this is written in my, in my notes. So what you get uh, in conclusion is that the integral of gamma is equal to two pi i times the sum over all of the all of these singularities. Over, where you sum over the winding number in AJ times the residue in the pole AJ. And this is then the residue theorem. And under what conditions, if we think about it, when, under what conditions will this apply, this theorem? And the answer, I would say, is that if you look at the proof, 
this part that subtracting a minus one over z minus a gives the derivative of some holomorphic function. This is always true. Now the only tool that we are actually using is this Cauchy's theorem. So what we are led to uh, realizing is that this theorem should be true whenever we can apply Cauchy's theorem. And then you will remember that we had some different degrees of generality of Cauchy's theorem. We proved it for a disk, but then I stated a more general form, uh, which still might not be, you know, the absolute optimal uh, regularities, but I said that we, we don't really, I mean, this is not the main point of the course to go into pushing this regularity part as much as possible. So instead what we get, the general form of the residue theorem is that under the conditions of the Cauchy, of Cauchy's theorem, we get this formula that we just proved. So suppose that F is analytic, except for isolated, possibly an infinite number of singularities Uh, let's call them AJ, in a region, okay, I wrote omega, what I usually denote by U, then one over two pi I, I mean, there's no special reason for changing the notation here, so, the integral gamma F of Z dZ, now I put the one over two pi i on this side. This you can do, of course, as you wish. This is equal to the sum of all the j of n of gamma j residue of f in a j. And this is true for any closed curve gamma uh, or actually, so a more general statement would be uh, a cycle, okay. So we don't go through in this course exactly what it means to be a cycle, but let's say that it's a technical term that you can find in all Foch and in other books. Let me just put it there. But so any closed curve gamma, which is homologous to zero, if you remember. So this was, uh, you know, you remember it could be just a circle, but it could also be this uh, Pokhammer path. You remember this that looked a little bit like some kind of figure eight, but that wind, wound around these two points in such a way that it was homologous to zero, but not homotopic to the trivial path. This was anyway the assumption that we put and explained when we were talking about the Cauchy's theorem. Okay, and then we also, uh, have to assume that none of the AJs are on the curve gamma. If the singularities are on gamma, then we have a problem. But usually, if that's the case, then we can just move gamma a little bit. So problem is usually easily solved. But anyway, the theorem, strictly speaking, applies only if the poles are not on gamma. Okay, and just to the final thing to make sure that this theorem makes sense is again, this this part here, you know, if I, now we have already discussed this, so you will understand this because we already talked about it, but this is an infinite sum a priori, right? So I'm summing over J, where J is the index set for the singularities, which could be an infinite set. So then the question is, does this sum in the right-hand side, does it converge? And the answer, but it's important to just remark this. It's that actually this one has a finite number of non-zero terms. So it could be an infinite, strictly speaking, infinite number of terms, but I mean, all of them except the finite number have to be zero because the winding number has to be zero whenever you're outside of gamma 
and there are only a finite number of poles inside gamma. Okay? So the right hand side has a finite number of non zero terms. So convergent in particular. Okay. So And again, I cannot underline enough that it holds also for isolated singularity. So this was the residue theorem. Any questions about that? Of course, we will keep discussing it. Okay, so uh, then we'll do what I guess is also a sort of recap. on uh, computing residues in practice. So uh, the first case is, of course, if you know the power series expansion. So zero, so sorry, the Laurent series, I keep saying power series. So if you know the Laurent series expansion, And of course, it is easy. And it's easy even if F has an essential singularity. It doesn't matter that you have an infinite number of terms in your Laurent series. I mean, the residue is the one that is here anyway, so if you have the series, then it's really easy. Uh, in general, it is hard or impossible almost uh, for essential singularities. So at the very least in this course, uh, if you have a function with an essential singularity and you want to have its residue in order then to be able to compute such an integral, then you will do well probably to try for the power series expansion, the Laurent series expansion. Now for poles, however, we have some tricks to, uh, to compute this. Okay, so no doubt you will have seen this. Uh, following proposition. Okay, so suppose that F has a pole of order N at A. Then we have essentially, I will give a general formula for a function which has a pole, and then there is a more specialized formula for rational functions with, with poles. Okay, so the first one is, uh, is always applicable to these meromorphic functions then that we are dealing with for functions with poles. So the residue can be calculated in the following way. So what you do is you take your function f, so it's here. Take your function f, you multiply by z minus a to the n, you differentiate it n minus one times, you take the limit as z goes to a, and you divide by one over n minus one factorial. Okay? 
uh, looks complicated, maybe, but it's, uh, I mean, the proof is really easy. So the proof uh, so it's straightforward. So let me just do it in the case when n equals 2, perhaps, as an illustration, and then it's always the same. So then f of z is a minus 2 over z minus a squared. That's a minus 1 over z minus a plus a0 plus a1z plus a2z squared. Uh, sorry, z minus a. and so on. And what I want to find is this a minus 1, of course. So how do I do it? Well, I can just, first of all, multiply by z minus a squared in this case. That means that z minus a squared, f of z, then I get rid of this. I get a minus 2 plus a minus 1, z minus a, plus a0, z minus a squared, and so on. Then I can differentiate it. So I differentiate what I have here. I hope you can see this color, by the way. Maybe it's bad. So I differentiate this. And then you get rid of this term. And here you will be left by it with a minus 1. And then, finally, you take the limit. Z goes to A of this whole thing. And then all of these terms will have Z minus A, Z minus A squared, Z minus A cubed, and so on. So they will all tend to 0. And then this will be equal to A minus 1. Okay? And now I did N equals 2. So I divided by... 1 over 1 factorial, which was just 1. If I had done it for n equals 3, 4, and so on, I would have some factor here, and I would have to divide it away. But you see that the proof is really, uh, really easy. So in case you forget the formula, you can easily find it again this way. And the second one is, uh, in the special case, uh, if you have a rational function, The rational function is f over g, where f and g are analytic. Uh, at a, and we assume that g of a is non-zero. The denominator, domi denominator, sorry, is not vanishing. Ah, uh, no, sorry. f of a is not zero. This is what we assume. And we assume that G has a simple uh, zero. So we didn't use this terminology, but so simple pole or a simple zero, it means that you have a zero or a pole of order one. And double means of order two, triple means of order three, and so on, quite intuitively. So we assume several things. So we assume that F of A is not zero. We assume that G has a simple zero at A. So if, if G, so these two conditions will mean that F over G will have a simple pole at zero, right? At A, sorry, simple pole at A. And then we can compute the residue of F over G at the point A just by taking f of a divided by g prime of a. So this can often be a, a simple way, and sometimes it's useful. So especially if you have rational functions, it's very easy to evaluate a polynomial. It's easy to differentiate and then evaluate the polynomial. And then it could be useful to, to have this kind of thing. Uh, as a remark, 
uh, this, I mean, I underline that this is for simple, uh, this is for when f over g has a simple pole. So f of a has to be non-zero, g has to have a simple zero at a. If it had a double zero at a, then there is still a formula, but it's much more complicated, actually. So, so I can write it down just so that you have seen it, get some, some feeling for what's going on. So the one I wrote down over there is very easy to, to check, in a similar way as the other proof. Uh, let me make this uh, remark. So if uh, A was instead a double zero of G, then there is a more complicated formula much more complicated, I would say. But let me write it down. So uh, the residue of f over g at a would then be equal to the following. So 6 times f prime of a b bis, so differentiate twice, of a. This is definitely not the formula I know by heart or ever uh, really used, to be honest. Three times, okay, so three times I differentiate here. So I write this down mainly just so that you see that it exists, but I do not expect you to know this uh, formula or really use this, okay? So just so that you know it exists. So there is this kind of thing. And I'm not sure what would be the formula for a triple pole, something like that. But just you know, so we have this kind of formulas. And the general, the, the number one here always holds. And the second one holds under these conditions. And first and foremost, only if the function is, is rational. Okay, and so, and for essential singularities, uh, I've already told you that you need the need the Logan series expansion. So next time, so uh, there are two possible topics. So that I want to cover actually in the next, uh, let's say, one and a half lectures is what I would have if I keep my normal schedule. So it would be that applications to uh, computing real integrals the applications of the residue theorem right and applications to the argument uh, principle and also this theorem called uh, Rouchet's theorem Okay, so real integrals, it would typically be something like the integral from minus infinity to infinity of, you know, something like this. So where you have these integrals, so this one would be an example of an integral that occurs in probability theory. Uh, it's actually the Fourier transform of one over x squared plus one in uh, whatever you call the variable, alpha equals minus one. And this one cannot be evaluated, this integral from minus infinity to infinity, using normal calculus methods. On the other hand, you can use the residue theorem, uh, as I'm sure many of you have seen, to evaluate this kind of integrals. And the idea is that you can take this gamma, you can integrate now using the residue theorem along any curve, but in particular, you can integrate along a real axis, okay? So you can take the real axis to be, uh, is, where you, is where you're interested in integrating, 
But to apply the residue theorem, you have to make it into a closed curve in some way. For example, a common way is doing this. And then evaluating what happens. I mean, you can compute then the integral over this whole thing, and then you have to compare the integral on everything with the integral on the line part. This would be how you solve this integral. Then you have other choices of contours and so on. And it's a whole sort of uh, toolkit of techniques to learn to be really good at evaluating these real integrals. But I can tell you already now that every year there is one such integral on the exam. And you know, you would do well, of course, to, you know, I think many of you think that you are very good at this already. And maybe you are. But I am willing to bet, at least from previous years, that some of you are not as good as you think you are at computing these integrals. So actually, uh, it's unnecessary to lose points over this on the exam, basically. So I will, uh, I will try to do as many of these as I have time for in the lectures. But it will also require that you, that you practice it on your own. And I will, do, I will try to go through a systematic um, so sort of there's a division of five different types of such integrals that they go through in Alfosh. If you have a book, Alfosh, you can look at it already now. There are five types. I will try to at least put in the lecture notes all of these five types. And then it, during the lectures, I think it's very likely, it seems, that I will have time to go through only some of them. But hopefully through homeworks and tutorials and with reading the lecture notes and Alfosh, if, if you have, you will get enough practice to be able to actually deal with any of the more common integrals of this kind that you can, you can get. And then, of course, I need to also tell you about the argument principle also on, already on Monday, which is another beautiful direct application of the, of the residue theorem. OK, so this is the plan for, for the next two lectures, roughly, lectures 12 and 13. And I'll stop here. So thank you. And if there are any questions. Professor. Yes. Actually, I wanted to discuss with you about the confusion that I was having about uh, um, the power series. And uh, like I wrote in the emails, uh, if yeah. F and G have uh, uh, if f and g are equal in some neighborhood of zero, let's say, then um, it seems to me, uh, in a, like in the example that you gave, if I compute, uh, if I restrict uh, the exponential of g to a unit disk, and if I uh, let it be zero elsewhere, then uh, the power series of that function would equal the power series of uh, xg, right? It will equal to the power series of e to the z, yeah, in uh, the disk, yeah? Uh, at zero. So uh, it seems to me somehow that, uh, of course, we're losing information by going to the power series. We're not, uh, um, by going to the power series, we are somehow uh, getting a function that uh, we can extend this uh, restricted uh, exponential to be. Um, and so if I, I was wondering if, uh, of course, this should not be possible because of what you've told earlier in the classes, but um, if, if there was some singularity around, then uh, as you've said, uh, the power series, would, the, the radius of convergence of the power series would be constrained by it. Um, uh, but if if uh, if if we had similar situation in uh, as in the case of the exponential, then somehow it seems to me that uh, uh, the the rest the function with singularity is uh, by by going to the power series we would be able to remove some sort of singularities. I'm not sure if I make all the sense, but I I'm, I'm really... so, I, so I think I understand. Uh... I, I, I really, I sympathize with your intuition, let's put it that way, so. Uh, but, but it still sounds like you're, I think what you're getting at is something like, 
Okay, you understand my examples that the function might not be holomorphic outside, there might be problems, there might be singularities, but if you have a part where it's nice and you want to sort of uh, modify the function to something different using the power series, it sounds like right. this is what you're saying. Right, and, something like yeah, that. Yeah, so you have some G and G is not nice, but it's nice on the unit disk. On the unit disk, it has power series that coincides with some entire function, maybe F, like in the example of E to the Z. Right. Yeah, so then you could uh, take this function G and say, okay, I don't like it outside of the unit disk. Let's study instead F. You can do that, but and it's no longer... Right. Good. Yeah. Right, again, by... Um, uh, no, uh, I don't have to... Uh, the, the thing that I was getting at is, uh, I think, like this. I don't have to a priori know that there exists some F that is entire, but uh, I can find such F by going to the power series. Yeah, yeah, this is also true, yeah. Right, and uh, I was uh, thinking why it would not be true, why something like this would not be true when there are singularities around. So, uh, as you've said in all your lectures, that, and I think that is correct as well, uh, that uh, if there is some singularity around, we are constrained to the radius of convergence that, that hits so the maximum radius of uh, radius that states uh, the singularity, and uh, I I can't get my head around why why something like that something like the earlier thing could mo could not be true in this setting. Yes, I mean so uh, let's imagine we have a meromorphic function or something. So it has some poles in places, and then you look at the, at the disk where it is holomorphic. So there are singularities elsewhere, but not exactly where you are. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, when you try to do this analytic continuation, when you try to extend it, you know, it will work, but not in the singularities. So you will not be able to extend it to an entire function such that it equals your meromorphic function everywhere. So this, this cannot happen. Right, but uh, well, here's my contention because uh, we can we can uh, out outside of uh, uh, the in the example that you gave uh, uh, outside the unit disk, I can have as many singularities. I can create as many singularities as I can. Can I not? Yes, you can, but uh, not being meromorphic or something like that. So, so it, I mean, it all depends on uh, you know on which set you want your new function to be equal to your old function. So if you want your, if you want your new function uh, f, let's call it, to equal your old function g on you know, the largest possible set outside of these singular points, then I mean, right. you know, there, there is some restriction there. I mean, then this right. would only be possible if it's actually meromorphic. <laughs> Okay, but uh, uh, let me try to uh, push it a little forward, uh, push it a bit forward with this example that you gave. Uh, uh, so I have a uh, exponential on the unit disk, and I have singularities outside it. Yeah. Right. But by by going to the power series centered at zero. Yeah. Um, I will be able to get an entire function. Yes. That has infinite radius I mean, of convergence, and that. Yeah. Uh, that is somehow contradicting with the fact that it hits, uh, it is stopped by the singularities. No, so it's that not, is, uh, yeah, so, so the reason it is not contradicting this thing is that the function we constructed in the example is, I mean, it's definitely very far from being meromorphic. It's something that's uh, like, uh, I mean, it's more like uh, in the style of a real valued function over R2. You know, so, right. so it, it has lost all of the properties, essentially, that we, that we have when we build the theory of complex analysis. So you're, I mean, you're missing many ingredients for this to be able to hold. So it's not like your function is meromorphic except, I mean, so holomorphic except at some singular points. No, it's just holomorphic on the unit disk, and then it's completely wild from the point of view of complex analysis. Okay. So this is why it doesn't work. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it works for it works if uh, it's a meromorphic function. If I had a meromorphic continuation of uh, exponential of g outside the unit disk, then I would not be able to get the entire power series power series of the entire function. Yeah, not in such a it's, way that not in such a way that it uh, coincided with g everywhere except at the singularities anyway. Yeah. 
uh, uh, I mean, uh, then uh, if I had uh, some sort of metamorphic continuation of exponential of G outside the in unit disk, then um, uh, the power series would be uh, power series of that function at zero would be constrained by the singularities, right, Professor? Yeah, it would be. So when okay. you would try to do analytic continuation, you could get as far as uh, this meromorphic function if you want, if you insisted on this analytic continuation to equal your meromorphic function everywhere where it was possible. You know. Okay. Yeah. Is there is there some? Uh, I still feel like I'm <laughs> missing a lot of things. So. Yeah. Um, is there some sort of text that I could look into? Because I'm really confused about this. Uh, about this particular thing? So, I mean, they for sure mention yes. it in all Fosh. Otherwise, I'm not sure where there is. Uh, like, I mean, any standard textbook would talk about it, but uh, I mean, there is a chapter on analytic continuation in all Fosh. I don't know if you have a book. Um, um, I have a book by Conway. So, maybe okay. he has it. Yeah, so you can see if they talk about analytic continuation. Otherwise, I mean, online you can type analytic continuation and you find many things. Uh, I don't have any, you know, special favorite in mind or anything like that. Uh, I would, rec I mean, I would recommend you Alfos or any other book of your choice, basically, to read about analytic continuation. But, um, yeah, so I mean, your intuition is on track, but you know, you just have to, um, yeah, clarify in your, to yourself, in your mind, um, exactly, what is going on, I think. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. But, but I, I withstand with my answer from last time, from the emails. Right, so uh, just to, just to <laughs> conclude this discussion, I would like just to say what I, uh, summarize what I understand. Is that okay, Professor? Yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Okay, so if, uh, uh, for example, in the example you gave, we had this uh, exponential function restricted to the unit disk, mm -hmm. and, uh, if we had uh, if we had some sort of meromorphic continuation of uh, that exponential function out there outside the unit disk, then um, the power series expansion of that function at zero would be constrained by the singularities or poles or whatnot outside it. But uh, uh, if uh, but if it is some wild other function, if it is not complex uh, in right. Okay, so, so let me let me write maybe summarize on the board. So like let's say okay, uh, let's say that uh, f f is entire. So I hope you can see if it's filming. Yeah, okay, good. Yes. So f is entire. So it's holomorphic everywhere. So g is meromorphic. Okay, so on C. Uh, but it's holomorphic on the unit disk. Let's say. Just to take an example, and we assume that uh, f is uh, identically equal to g on on the unit disk, right? It's something like that that you want to to do. Is yes, this, professor. Is this yes. true? Yeah. Then actually, this is not possible already. Okay. So this is the first remark. Because it would imply, it would force f to have actually poles where g has poles. Uh, because by the identity theorem, uh, so f equals g on the disk, which is an open set, implies that f is equal to g on the, on the larger open set, which is c minus the set of poles of g, where they are both holomorphic. So you remember, so I can apply the identity theorem with this open set. I think professor, yes. Yeah, so then f is equal to g on all of this open set. So and then if f is equal to a meromorphic function everywhere where it doesn't have poles, it cannot be... Right, it would be unbounded near the poles. Yeah, that it would be, be unbounded near the poles, so it definitely yes. cannot be entire. Right, right. Uh, on the other hand, if you take, uh, if you remove this example and just say that f is holomorphic, okay, let's see here. 
But if you say that the same thing f is entire, you say that g is uh, holomorphic on uh, the disk or whatever, and f is equal to g on, uh, I mean, let's say g is holomorphic on some open set u, let's put it this way, and f is equal to g on the disk, which is contained inside u, then this implies that, uh, that g is equal to f on all of this open set u, but outside of u, uh, I mean, g can do still whatever it wants. I mean, the analytic continuation will find f. So outside of u, g can be, let's call it wild. It can do whatever it wants. It could be just zero everywhere or, I mean, in that sense, wild. And the analytic continuation Well, if I put it in this vague way, so it will detect uh, it will detect the function f because f is the function which is holomorphic. So, so when you take the analytic continuation, you will find f, and outside of this set where g is holomorphic, the analytic continuation has absolutely no relation with g anymore. Thank you, professor. That is exactly what I wanted. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so uh, yeah, that was a long question. Uh, so if anybody else has a question, I'm still here, but otherwise I think we'll go have lunch. Okay, so uh, yeah, so in the future, I think this option of lecturing on my iPad in my office, I'll just have to scratch it because, uh, you know, it's just not working at ICTP these days. So I'm... Uh, I'm going to have to do either a Blackboard if I'm at ICTP or I can do iPad from home. <laughs>